Well, hey, everyone, I want to welcome you to worship again, whether you're worshiping here in the room or whether you're watching this on video. We're so glad that you joined us. Now, I think it's human nature for us to ask questions, right? If you have small children, you know that questions just kind of flow out of them. And I think we have lots of questions all throughout our life. I have a bunch of questions I would love to ask God. How about you? Like, do you imagine one day when you're in heaven, you know, pulling up a chair next to God's throne and saying, all right, God, I've got a few questions for you, a few things I'd like you to explain. You know, I think one of the first ones at the top of my list would be, God, why did you make it so difficult to be a Minnesota sports fan? Right? Can I get a witness? Yeah, it's pretty hard. But of course, there are a lot of serious questions that we might want to ask God. We might want to get his perspective. You know, God, could you just explain why life is like this? Could you just explain why this happened? Now, if I were to have you come up tonight and to plot your life on a graph, to kind of draw it out, I'm willing to guess it probably doesn't look like this, right? None of us have just a perfectly neutral life with nothing that happens where we just kind of coast through, right? That doesn't look like a normal life. Now, more likely, you'd come up and draw something maybe like this. Probably have some great high points in your life as you look back. You probably also have a fair amount of low points, some difficulties. You know, you might look at something like that and say, you know, I remember when I graduated from high school. Maybe that was the 1998 NFC Championship game. Maybe this was when I met my wife, children are born, but then maybe diagnosed with an illness. There might be different highs and different lows along the way. Now, I'm willing to guess that no one here has spent a lot of time questioning God about the high points, right? Like, God, how could you give me so many good things in my life? You know, God, how could you bless me again and again and again? Like, we don't have too many problems. We don't have too many questions about the good things in life, about the high points. But when it comes to the low points, I think that's where we have the questions, right? God, how could you allow this to happen to me? God, how could this come to pass in my life if I'm following you? God, if you're good, why is there so much pain? Why are there so many times that I'm struggling you know, God, why do bad things happen? You know, why did my parents get divorced? Why did my boyfriend or girlfriend break up with me? Why did my loved one die so young? Why did I get diagnosed with cancer? Some of you might remember back in the 90s, there was a really popular phrase that was often used at church. The person up front would come up and say, God is good. And the people in the audience would say, all the time. And the person up front would say, all the time. And the congregation would say, God is good. Now, it's a great phrase. It's a great refrain. But when you're in those low points, don't you start to question that a little bit? Is God really good? If God is good, then why does life hurt so much? We hear those simple little phrases. They're easy to say. God is good. God is love. God has a plan. God has a purpose. But if so, what do we do with all the suffering in the world? If that's all true, then what about pain? And what about evil? And what about death? I mean, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-loving, well, when all those low points happen, when all that pain comes into our life, well, does that mean he just doesn't care? Does it mean he went on vacation? Does it mean he actually doesn't have the power to change anything? If God is who he says he is, then why doesn't he intervene? Because you might be thinking, life is tough right now. You know, and I'm calling out to him. And he doesn't seem to be responding. So where is God when we hurt and where is God when we suffer? Well, there's a guy in the Bible that many of you have heard of. His name is Job. Pastor Jason talked a little about him a couple weeks ago. 
But Job was kind of a cross between Bill Gates and Mother Teresa. You see, he was an incredibly prosperous farmer in northern Israel, but he was also an incredibly devoted follower of God. We get this whole list of kind of all his assets. He's got livestock, he's got camels, he has sheep, which we might not be super impressed with, but it was a sign of wealth. It was kind of his portfolio. But not only that, he also had many servants and he had a large family, which back then meant you were especially blessed by God. And he's also described as being a faithful follower of God. Just this all around amazing man. Well, one day Satan comes on the scene and he's having coffee with God. Now Satan's name means the accuser. So he starts to accuse Job. He tells God, you know, the only reason this guy follows you and trusts you and puts you in his life is because he's wealthy. I mean, he's got everything. If you would take those things away, there's no way that he would continue to follow you. Well, God takes him up on his wager. And he says, basically, Satan, you can do anything to Job except mess with his health. So Satan comes and he does some horrible things. He destroys Job's livestock, his children, his servants, and his home. But through it all, Job continues to trust in God. He continues to follow him, even while experiencing great pain and suffering. Now Satan goes back to God and he says, well, the only reason he's continuing to follow you is because he has his health. So God says, all right, you can do anything to him except kill him. So Satan comes and he covers Job with boils and he is absolutely miserable. So much so that even Job's wife is suffering and at her wit's end. And finally she comes to Job and she says, I think you should just curse God and die. Can you imagine being at that point? I mean, it is so hopeless. Things look so bleak. I think at this point, you should just curse God and die. But Job replies in an incredible way. He says, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? That's a pretty profound question, right? Especially when you're covered in boils. You know, we often ask, why do bad things happen to good people, right? It's a pretty normal question, but we never seem to ask, why do good things happen to bad people, right? It's all about perspective. Job is still faithful to God. He's still following and trusting after him, even amidst his pain and his suffering. So Job's friends come and they have some advice. Do you have any friends like this who love to give advice? Job's friends say, well, there's got to be something you're hiding. Like, you have some secret you don't want anybody to know about. Just come clean and repent of that secret, and it'll all be over with. But Job maintains his innocence, and he keeps on trusting God. But he has questions, 42 chapters of questions, if you read his book. If God is good then why in the world is there so much suffering and pain? I mean, it's one of the big questions of faith. Virtually anyone who examines Christianity at some point has asked that question. If God is good, why is there so much suffering and pain in this world? Well, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, now we see things imperfectly, as in a poor mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me now. He's basically saying, we're not going to understand everything this side of heaven. Right now, it's kind of like looking into a dim mirror. You kind of get some idea of what it's all about. But until that day that we get to go sit next to God and ask our questions, we're not going to fully understand. Kind of makes me think of back when I was in college. I went to a college up in the Fargo-Moorhead area. 
And every winter, a few times, we would be driving on 94 to get back to school in a blizzard. And sometimes the blizzard would be a whiteout and we would hardly know if we were on the road or not. In fact, the only way sometimes we knew we were on the road was if we could see the taillights of the car in front of us. Well, you know, the Bible provides taillights for us in the dimness of this world. When we can't know everything, we can go to God's word and we can see some lights that help us make sense of some of our big questions. So I think there are a few things that we can know about why there is suffering and evil and pain in this world. Now, it's not going to answer every one of our questions, but these are some things that we can know for sure. The first thing I think we can know is that God is not the creator of suffering and evil. You know, people often ask, well, why didn't God just create a perfect world where everything is just great, everything is perfect, there's no pain and there's no suffering? Well, the answer is, he did. That is the world that he originally created. In Genesis 1.31, it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. God created a perfect world, the world that he wanted to exist in, in a perfect relationship with his creation. So if God didn't create suffering and evil, well, then where did they come from? Well, God gave human beings free will. It's the ability for us to make our own choices. Free will, when you think about it, is necessary to have and to be able to express love. True love is only possible when there's a choice. It can't be forced. It can't be downloaded. It can't be programmed. But unfortunately, from the very beginning, human beings have chosen to make bad choices. Every one of us chooses to disobey and to walk away from God. And you might say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Have you ever lied before, even the smallest lie? Have you ever cheated before? Maybe even in the smallest way. Have you ever stolen anything before? Maybe even the smallest thing. Not in comparison to anyone else, just answering for you. Well, if you say yes to those things, well, what does that make you? It makes you a liar, a cheater, and a thief, right? Every one of us is sinful. We fall short of God's standard. And the thing about sin is it always leads to brokenness, and it always leads to separation, and it always destroys relationships. Now, some ethicists say there are two broad categories of evil in our world, Kind of two big categories. The first is moral evil. Moral evil is when we choose to be self-centered, uncaring, and hateful towards others. And there are some that estimate 90, 95% of the suffering and pain in this world is caused by moral evil. People who sin and make selfish choices. For instance, when we read about famine around the world, and even food insecurity in our own country. Scholars tell us there is more than enough food for every single person on earth to have more than 3,000 calories a day. The only reason people go hungry is because of selfishness, because of sinfulness. People use all sorts of different things to bring suffering and pain to themselves and to others. But then there's another category, it's natural evil. Natural evil are natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes and cyclones. These are also the result of sin that's entered into creation. In Genesis 3, it says sin has impacted all of creation. It's brought brokenness throughout all of creation. And so the Apostle Paul says even creation itself cries out for redemption and help from God. God isn't the cause of suffering and evil. It's the devastating effect of sin. 
It's a result of our bad choices, our selfish behavior, and our brokenness. But it's not the end of the story. You see, the second thing we can know is that God can use suffering and pain to accomplish good. Again and again, God brings good out of very difficult situations. You might remember the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. It's a lot of singing and dancing, and the Pharaoh was dressed up like Elvis. Well, that was the musical if you saw it. But Joseph suffered greatly. Do you remember his brothers sold him into slavery because they were so mad and jealous of him? So they sold him into slavery. He was brought into Egypt. He was put into prison, and he was put on death row. He was about to be executed. He was there for about 10 years before he was brought out and he was given a position of influence, and he grew in power and stature until he was able to help his family when they faced a famine. And so one day, his whole family is standing in front of him. Remember the ones that sold him, and they are afraid of what Joseph is about to do. But in Genesis 50, verse 20, this is what Joseph says to them. He says, as far as I am concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. Think about that perspective. After all they had done, evil plots and plans, Joseph says, as far as I'm concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. Now, I think we see this all the time if we look. You know, there's natural disasters that take place. There's national tragedies that occur. And they're all over the news, but there seems to always be reports finding the good within those difficult circumstances. You know, there are people that are serving others. There's people that are stepping up and giving of their time and their money and their energy. There's love being shown and, and it just stands out. It's what we crave to see. God brings good out of suffering and pain. I'm reminded of the great theologian, Mr. Rogers. He's quoted as saying his mother told him whenever there was a tragedy or something scary happening, to look for the people who are helping. Look for the helpers. See, that's where God is bringing good out of suffering and pain. Now, I also think we've experienced this in our own lives. You know, we can look back and we can say, yeah, we've been through some difficult things, but maybe we're at where we're at today because of hardships that we've had to overcome. Things that we've learned, things that we've achieved, it's because of those difficult and painful experiences that we've had to find our way through. You know, maybe sometimes we look back at losing a job and we say, well, eventually we saw doors being opened and now we're at where we're at. Maybe we look back at a time of illness and we say, you know, that was a time that I grew spiritually like never before. You know, people aren't typically grateful for tragedies or for struggles or pain. I mean, we typically wouldn't choose them on our own. But oftentimes we end up grateful for the lessons we learn, for the growth that happens in us, maybe for building strength, building character. The Apostle Paul could identify with this. He, he talked about a thorn in his flesh that he had. It caused him great suffering. One time he, he was talking about it and he said he asked three times directly to God for him to take this thorn in his flesh away. But God responded, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul goes on to say, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight. Such an interesting word choice, such a powerful word choice. He says, I delight in weaknesses. 
in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties? Would you choose the word delight to accompany those things? And Paul does on purpose. Because he says, for when I am weak, it's then that I'm strong. You see, Paul's struggle with this thorn in his flesh taught him what he needed. And what he needed was God himself. Now imagine if we modeled Paul's perspective in our lives. If we were able to say, I will delight in my physical problems because they draw me nearer to Christ. I will delight in my job search because it teaches me God is my ultimate provider. I will delight in this difficult season because I learn that I can't rely on myself. I will delight in this lonely season because it reminds me that Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so I'm never alone. Now, I think the most powerful illustration of God's bringing something good out of something difficult is how God took the ultimate negative, the cross, and he turned it into something positive. God took the ultimate negative and he turned it into something positive. And through it, he defeated sin, death, and the devil once and for all, and he offers new life to us. You see, in Jesus, he experienced the depths of pain and suffering, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And God takes our pain and our suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it on personally in order to bring us hope and new life and freedom. What looked like a defeat ended up being a victory. Jesus took our place, he paid our penalty, and he opened the door to eternal life. And so number three, the end of suffering is coming. It's the good news. The end of suffering is coming. I think the problem is we have a perspective problem. Imagine this scenario. It's January 3rd. It's a new year. And you just have one of those days. You get pulled over for speeding. You get in, into an accident as you're coming down your street. You lose your wallet. You know, it's just an awful day. But then the rest of the year is great. You get a promotion at work. Your marriage is strong and happy. You get to go on a Caribbean vacation. And at the end of the year, if someone asked you, how was your year? You would quickly respond, it was great. But they might say, but what about January 3rd? I mean, wasn't that a horrible day? And you'd say, yeah, it was, it was a bad day, but... I mean, the rest of the year just outweighs those difficulties. You see, all of our pain and our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. Romans 8.18 says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will give us later. There was a young man who had fallen down some stairs at the age of one and shattered his back. So he had to be in and out of hospitals virtually his entire life. Yet he once made this astounding comment that he thinks God is fair to a pastor that was visiting him. So the pastor asked him, well, how old are you? And this young man said, well, I'm 17 years old. And the pastor said, well, how long have you been in the hospital? And he says, for about 14 years. And he said, well, then how in the world can you think God is fair? And the boy replied, well, God has all of eternity to make it up to me. You see, God promises there will be a day when there is no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, and no more death. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, have you ever gone to a movie before and you've been really excited about it and it just totally let you down? It was just disappointing. You know, maybe the middle was just boring and the end was awful. There is no chance of that happening. 
when it comes to God and what he's planned for us in heaven. He is not going to disappoint us. It's better than we can imagine. So I think it's amazing to see how people who deal with the exact same suffering respond sometimes in completely different ways. One person might reject God completely and just live an angry and bitter life, while another person might turn to God and become more gentle and loving and compassionate. Now, quick side note, it is okay to be angry with God. Just read through the Psalms. You'll see it again and again. Oftentimes, expressing those emotions can strengthen our relationship. But ultimately, we'll either run towards or run away from God. Ultimately, when facing suffering and pain, we'll either run towards God or we'll run away from God. Job's story continues on. So amidst all his suffering, he's covered in boils. His wife is telling him to curse God. He's got these friends giving him awful advice. He continues to trust and he continues to be confident in who God is. And in Job 19.25, he has this amazing statement. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I mean, he's still got questions for God, but he continues to trust and walk in faith. Now remember, faith and doubt are not opposite. He's got plenty of both. But when it comes down to it, where he finds comfort and peace is in that statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. I mean, in the middle of these awful trials, he says, I know. I've got confidence in at least one thing. He says, my, it's personal for him. He says, Redeemer, he knows he needs redemption. He needs someone to come and make everything right. And he says, lives. God is present and he's alive. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, we live in an incredibly broken and difficult world just like Job did. And we want an explanation. Well, God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation. It's the incarnation. God in the flesh. Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus into the mess of this world and he experienced it completely for us. Jesus experienced suffering and pain personally. So he knows your hurts. He knows what you're going through. And he meets us in our brokenness so that we can know we are never alone. You know, I think sometimes the most comforting thing is to have someone who understands what we're going through come alongside us. Right, if we're facing a diagnosis, if we're facing another trial in life, to have someone who comes and says, you know what, I've been through it and I've come out the other side. Let me walk with you. Jesus understands exactly what you're going through. He says, I've been through it. I've experienced the whole range of emotions. Jesus says, I've been there, I've done that, and I'm with you. In the middle of his pain and his questions, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. The question is, do you? Do you know that your Redeemer lives? Because that knowledge makes all the difference in the world. It means that death suffering, and pain don't have the last word because our Redeemer lives. Now, an amazing picture of what this looks like is a story that Richard Stearns tells. He was the former CEO of World Vision. He talked about visiting a church in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, right after their most devastating earthquake. And he was in this church, he said it was basically just tarps and duct tape right in the middle of thousands of people who were homeless living in a camp. And this is how he described the church and the lesson that he learned. 
He said, in the front row sat six amputees, ranging in age from six to 60. They were clapping and smiling as they sang song after song and lifted their prayers to God. The worship was full of hope and thanksgiving. No one, though, was singing louder or praying more fervently than Demosi Laufin, a 32-year-old unemployed single mother of two. During the earthquake, a collapsed building crushed her arm and her left leg. After four days, both limbs had to be amputated. But she was leading the choir, she was leading the prayers, she was standing on her prosthetic leg, and she was lifting her one good hand in the air to praise God. So following the service, I met Demosi's two daughters who were ages eight and 10. And the three of them now lived in a tent that was about five feet tall and eight feet wide. Despite losing her job, her home, and two limbs, she said she was deeply grateful because God had spared her life. She said, he brought me back like Lazarus, giving me the gift of life. And she said she believed she survived the quake for two reasons, to raise her girls and to serve the Lord for a few more years. Stern says, it makes no sense to me as an entitled American who grouses at the smallest inconveniences, a clogged drain, a slow Wi-Fi connection. Yet here in this place, many people who had lost everything express nothing but praise. So where does that kind of perspective come from? Why is it so difficult for us living in America? Well, what if we, just like Job, were to proclaim every day, I know my Redeemer lives. Because God's answer to suffering isn't an explanation. It's the in Incarnation, Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks how you meet us in our brokenness, in our pain, and our suffering. Because of Jesus, we know we are never alone that you understand every one of our emotions, every one of our questions, and you walk with us through the messiness and the brokenness. God, I pray for every person here. You know what's on our hearts and our minds. You know what baggage we have. You know what our story is. Yet you choose to stick with us. You choose to treat us with love and grace. And so, God, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to your truth, to your promises. Help us to trust you more, to take another step of faith with you today, and to proclaim each and every day, just like Job, I too know that my Redeemer lives. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.